And we're back for another exciting week of the Creators Collective. And uh, this week is is actually kind of a special one for me because we're, we're finally getting uh, Patreon up and going again. Uh, that was something we we had done a lot with in the past, and now it is, it's finally working again. So we're going to be doing some fun things for uh, you, the listeners. Um, if you have any particular uh, things you'd like us to see on Patreon, if there's any particular bonus, uh, we will be looking at that. But that being said, I do want to say a huge thank you to our current top patron, Darren Mates. Um, sorry, Darren, if I'm mispronouncing your last name. We had a discussion. That's, about that's what you do. I think for now on, I think <laughs> it is your job to intentionally mispronounce everyone like at least one part of everybody's name whether it's the first name or the last name <laughs> yeah. let's make it intentional that way we don't have to you know come up with excuses from here out so yes uh, this is uh bob joans oh it's, <laughs> it's johns <laughs> yeah just just jones, butcher, jones, jones, you have yeah. to put your names from from here out it's jone <laughs> So uh, thank you, Darren. Um, if you would like to find out more about that, you can uh, look up uh, Patreon uh, Creators Collective, and we're finally getting that up and going. Um, also, on top of that, we're going to be soon doing a few uh, swag items like uh, shirts. So uh, keep an eye out for that, and uh, let us know what you would like to see us do in the future. But uh, other than that, let's uh, let's jump into it. this. is This is kind of cool because we have a regular week. It's just the three of us here talking. Um, no, no guests and no one's missing. So this should be, uh, should be interesting, but, uh, what's that? I'm back. Yeah. I'm back. Will's back. So well, why don't you, why don't you kick us off? What are, what are you doing? Uh, I've been traveling. Uh, so I was in Charleston, South Carolina for the high water music festival for a weekend and my best friend's birthday, then flew back to Virginia for a day. Then the next day, uh, my wife and daughter and I jumped on a plane to San Diego, spent the night in San Diego, then drove down to Tijuana and jumped on a plane to Loreto, Mexico, where we spent a week uh, with my in-laws. It was a great time, a uh, lot of fun, boats, ATVs in the desert, just it was a lot of fun. Uh, then flew back to San Diego to spend some time with some family that I have out there uh, and my wife uh, and my wife's best friend, because my wife is originally from the San Diego area, Escondido, if you're familiar. Uh, and then flew back and now I'm back to work. And it feels really good after taking like two weeks off. Uh, Vacation is always awesome, but I always love getting back to work because I feel like such a lazy schmuck when I'm on vacation. Um, so I jumped back into the walnut dining table. Uh, I just got the top glued up yesterday. Uh, that's turning out really cool because uh, the walnut tree that they had milled came off the client's property and then they sold their farm and they moved into the city. Um, and they asked me to make a table with this stock that they had and uh i didn't really know what it was going to look like until i got a, got into milling it uh and i was able to book match all of the planks of the table so it's it's pretty cool the center of the table looks like these owl eyes um yeah and uh so it's just really cool and now i'm getting started on the base today uh it's going to be a, a big pedestal two pedestal base so it's like a pedestal trestle table if that makes sense so i'll have two pedestals with a trestle in between them um probably about eight inch round turned pedestals uh and i gotta work on the, the base components for that today before i can start gluing up the pedestal blank to turn so i know the actual uh height of it so i can get the final height of the table um i also just made a bunch of white oak coaster blanks um that i'm going to do a finish test with them so i'm going to finish each coaster with a different finish and then do things like hot coffee um uh, condensation on a, on a glass of ice water uh and just you know really run through through their paces and uh put a video out on that because i get co asked constantly what finish should i use what finish should i use what finish do you use um what's best for this and for the most part, I have a pretty good idea, but I've never actually run things side by side on the exact same piece. And like, you know, so this is going to be like my glue test, but, you know, on a much, much, much smaller scale because I'm not <laughs> as crazy as James. Um, I am, me and my wife are really getting into house plants right now, uh, trying to make our house 
more house plant friendly and not kill them. Uh, so I'm going to start turning some white oak um, planter platters to like catch the the water that as you water your plants is you know like the tray underneath the pot. Uh, and then the newest most exciting thing is I just got my my branding iron in with my logo on it from uh, Zach. Are you are you eating something? <laughs> Is it that loud? It's really, really loud. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll, uh, snack, snack. I, I have to finish what's in my mouth. I'll do it like <laughs> away from the microphone, and then uh, I guess the rest of it will just have to wait. <laughs> like the crunchiest, um, like the crunchiest granola bar I've ever eaten in my life. <laughs> uh, that was awesome. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so my new branding iron just got that in from Cranford Design Works. Uh, this thing looks great. Beefy. Yeah, I, I like it. Yeah, so I'd originally reached out to Tony Rulo of Hillview Wood and Metal, and he said, you know, like, ah, like your logo is just a little bit too uh, intricate for me, but check out this guy um, from Cranford, Cranford Design Works. And I sent him the logo, and he was like, yeah, I can do it. And it just came in the mail, and the thing is awesome. Uh, so I'm really, really excited about that. And then I also, right before our vacation, I kind of splurged on myself and <laughs> picked this out. That sounded bad. Yeah. Yep. Uh, well, when you hear what I got, you'll, you'll that's, splurge uh, too. That's, that's James territory there. That's something James says. <laughs> you might splurge Hashtag too. When things you're... that James says, that needs to be a thing. <laughs> uh, yeah. Shirts, shirts. Definitely need to have some James isms on some shirts. Uh, no, I picked up, uh, a steel MS 650 Magnum chainsaw. Uh, yeah. Happiness. So, Why do they make them sound them. like, uh, like a assault weapon? What's it called again? <laughs> it's the steel MS 650 Magnum. Yeah. So, that sounds like it should be illegal. Yeah. Right. So the 650 is the size of the engine, and the Magnum, I'm pretty sure, refers to the big bore of the cylinder. The girth. The girth. The girth. <laughs> yeah. See? <laughs> Talk about splurge. Um, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> so really excited about that. Uh, picked it up with a brand new 24-inch bar and chain on it, but I've got a 42-inch bar and some ripping chain uh, that I already had. So, yeah, I'm going to get into milling some stuff. Uh, Really, really excited about that. But yeah, how about you guys, Zach? What do you What do you got going on? Uh, well, I was trying to eat a granola bar. <laughs> um, it's the most recent project. Uh, so no, I'm. I don't even remember. I am such a scatterbrain. Uh, so I started. Uh, I did my first segmented anything. I don't know if you guys. Yeah, that code. Saw the, yeah, that so was- I count. What's that? that was awesome. That was awesome. Thanks. I was really, really impressed with like, yeah, like, yeah, it's gonna lay it. Yeah, whatever. Like, let's do some segmented turning. Like, and it's just I'm good at it. So, I mean, I I don't know. I mean, I, I think if you don't know any better, you can do things that you probably shouldn't be able to do. Like, I just I guess I just didn't know any better. I'm like, I don't want to make a, I don't want to make a pen. I mean, <laughs> that's I a, now I you sound have, like me. I don't have like a four foot bad on that thing so that I can turn pans. Uh, but I mean, not that there's anything wrong with that. I've actually made pans and it's kind of fun, but uh, I don't know. Um, yeah. So that was a lot of fun, but I used the, the miter set thing to do the um, segments and I did a, I did a mock-up. You can see here, like this is one that I just did out of pine just to see if it worked. And this one's a little bit sloppy. So I found that I was getting, um, you know, I did like 18 segments on the one per ring. There's actually a lot of math. Like it, it is very intricate. I mean, when you know the, the, the taper that you want, you know, if you every, it's kind of an X, Y axis thing. You know, if you draw a line down the center of, you know, if you imagine your cone in two dimensions and you figure out your radius and then you have to figure out like how much, uh, for the, the desired taper, how, how much larger each ring has to be. And then you have to do, um, Paul Jackman actually has a, a calculator. It doesn't tell you the tapering, but it tells you the length of each segment for how many segments for whatever your desired diameter is, which is really handy. Um, but yeah, anyway, so the first one that I did, I was having this issue and my table saw is like, 
I mean, granted, it's like a 60 year old Delta Unisaw that has no technology or any, it doesn't have a riving knife or anything. It's like the, just a pretty much just a huge motor and a table. <laughs> so, but, um, I have it set dead accurate. Like I have, I got a micrometer out and, or dial indicator and it's, I've had no issues with it since the day I, I tuned it up, you know, a couple of years ago, but I was getting these weird cut issues with the cuts when I was doing these segments, I was actually getting a, uh, not a concave, but a convex cut on everything. So when I went to try and glue my miters up, I mean, it's, you have these, you know, two pieces that are bowed outwards at the ends and you're trying to have nice segments for the outside to turn them down. So trying to figure out what was going on, checked everything out. And it turns out it was just a dull blade. <laughs> so <laughs> if, uh, I, I put a new, uh, I just, I put a new blade on there and everything was perfect. So if anybody ever has that issue, that's, uh, might want to consider that. So, um, yeah, but I was, it turned out really well. I was originally going to do two stools because I wanted to do one that had alternating maple and walnut segments. But after seeing the way that that one turned out with just the walnut, I think it's going to look really good. So that's actually part of a stool. I've had a lot of people asking like, what the hell are you going to do with this cone? <laughs> so um, it'll come together. You'll just have to stay tuned on the, the Instagram. So that's the latest project that I've been working on. Um, if you were going to make it, if you're going to make it for a client, would you use that as a stool sample? Ooh. Oh, that was bad, right? Yeah, that was that was terrible. <laughs> My grandparents in their house, they have this tiny little film canister, and out the outside it is written on its stool sample sitting on the windowsill. <laughs> and for those who get curious, if you open it up, there's a tiny little stool inside. That's funny. <laughs> Sorry, I totally just derailed you, Zach. <laughs> it's all right. It's well, all that's right. our joke for the week. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, uh, so we'll yeah, back. <laughs> yeah, the the stools. What I've been working on. That's the, the most recent uh, project. And then yesterday, I was since I've been waiting for some uh, abrasives, like some flap discs that I'm going to use to finish some of the metal um, that Fared is sending me. Um, I kind of took a day off and just messed around the shop yesterday. And I got my hydraulic press. It showed up a couple of days ago and getting the caster. I don't know why, like it's totally obvious that it wouldn't come with the casters on it. Um, but for some reason in my mind, I'm like, Oh, it'll have casters on it. I'll just wheel it up the driveway. And, uh, <laughs> that's, uh, it's obvious now that I just didn't think about it, but yeah, the casters weren't on it. So the thing weighs 1300 pounds. Uh, we got it in the garage, but then trying to put the casters on it was a nightmare. And it's, I'm incredibly stubborn. And this was like one of the first times that I pushed against something with all of my strength and nothing happened. Like I thought, Oh, I'll be able to like tip it and rock it over the edge and put the wheels on nothing. <laughs> like It took, uh, my dad and I had to like push on the top of it just to get the leverage and then I slid like a half inch piece of round stock under it and we were able to like slowly creep it over the edge and it was a nightmare. But anyway, I've just been smashing everything in my shop. Anything I can think of, I've just been crushing it. So, um, yeah, I'm really excited to actually get to use it to make stuff. But um, you should do yeah. a video. You should do like a, se uh, a series on your channel like Zach smashes, like Zach smash. And yeah, like, well, I think like I should do it with judging from the Instagram video I put out yesterday of my wife just crushing a can. I don't know if you guys saw that. Mm -mm. I didn't see it yet. It no. already has like almost 150,000 views. It's literally just my wife smashing an empty can. And it's like gone viral on Instagram. It's crazy. So, yeah, I don't know. I think I think she's kind of got that on lockdown. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so, yeah, the forging press, messing around with that yesterday. Since it was kind of a down day for me, I had this old broken wrench. I don't know if you guys oh, yeah. can see it there. I uh, forged that into a knife that is insanely sharp. Like I could shave my face with this thing. So that was kind of fun. So I just, it was nice to have just a day messing around the shop. So a little bit of everything. Sweetness. What I've been up to. Who's next? Cool. Well, <laughs> I, I've been working on my dining room table and, uh, uh, last week we did flattening the the slabs and that was a lot of fun using power tools that was 
weird. <laughs> but I uh, finally got to pouring the epoxy and I poured the, the first layer, uh, which is about a quarter inch of a metallic blue that just fills the bottom. And my, my plan is to fill the bottom with that and then fill the rest up with absolute crystal clear um, epoxy so you can see down into it. And so it sort of looks like a lake in the bottom of a canyon. Uh, and I'm, I'm loving the way it's looking. I, I poured the, the bottom layer and then I went and got uh, eco epoxy. Um, now, if you ever worked with eco epoxy liquid plastic, it pours just like water. It is extremely runny for an epoxy. Um, and the pour I'm doing is a two to one. So it's, it takes three days for it to set, but when it does, it is perfectly clear. There's not a bubble in the thing. It is just a gorgeous, gorgeous epoxy. It just takes some time and it's very runny. You'd think that would actually be much better for like, uh, not getting air bubbles in your stuff, having it like a thinner viscosity. Yeah. That's, that's one of the things is that it, um, uh, you can mix it with a, with a, with a power paddle on a drill and, you know, whip in all the bubbles you want. Wow. 20 minutes later, all the bubbles have floated to the top and pop. How, how long does it take to cure? Uh, three days. Holy crap. Yeah. It takes three days to get to the point where it's solid and it takes a week in order for it to get tool, uh, hard enough to be tool worked. Um, so it, it takes a ton, but it's, it is so worth it because it is just, it, it's, it's like, it literally looks like the absolute perfect clear glass. Uh, wow. There's, there's no tinting to it. There's no color. It's just absolutely clear. I like the idea of that, but I know that in my surroundings, it would have like a quarter inch of like metal shavings and, <laughs> yes. uh, you know, dust like yeah. embedded in the top three days is a long time, but yeah. So I, I, I made the assumption that because I poured the quarter inch of the, the thicker epoxy that has the, 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 me the metallic tinting into it, um, uh, that it would, that that would, you know, fill all the gaps and whatnot. Uh, but apparently in one of the slabs, there was an overlap of tape where the tape kind of bunched up and I didn't put a second layer of tape over that. And one of the slabs, I had an entire gallon worth of the epoxy leak out and just run all the way across the floor. <laughs> not happy everything was looking good that night and i went to bed and i came out the next morning and my shop floor is covered in a a thin skim of epoxy well, at least you had three days to clean it up yeah <laughs> well, yeah and uh oh, huh. so it was um you know a gallon's worth of the epoxy which is not cheap um so i uh, uh i cleaned all that up and now I have it setting. So I'm waiting until these cure and I'm ordering in more epoxy to, to repour that one. Um, but uh, oops. Oh, well. <laughs> so I have a video coming out today that it was supposed to be the entire epoxy pour, but it was me showing the first half and then coming down and being like, oh, stink. You could have like an epoxy river floor in yes. your shop. <laughs> That's the next big thing. Well, the nice thing is I had a crack in the in the basement floor, and it's filled that nicely. So, oh, well, right. that's it. You know, silver lining. Yeah, yeah. Uh, how thick are you? Pour so you did the the first layer, quarter inch. How mm -hmm. thick are you doing the the second pour? Are you filling it all the way to the top, or um, I'm filling it just shy of the top. It ends up being about an inch and three quarters thick. Okay, uh, that's the other nice thing about the eco epoxy is that you can pour it up to two inches thick without having any heating issues. Ah. Um, and so it's. It, because it cures so slowly, you know, if you were to use West system, if you pour West system much more than like a quarter inch thick, it just, it boils. Um, and it will have a runaway, um, you know, it'll cure in five minutes because it heats up. And if, if it heats up too fast, it'll actually catch the wood on fire. Wow. Um, yep. I want to see that. That would be a good video. I I've actually see, I had uh, paper cups catch on fire from it in the past. I want to see somebody make intentionally an epoxy river table that just catches on fire and burns into ashes. Ooh, that would that, be, that, that would be that, awesome. The hell river table. <laughs> yes. Well, and the other thing the is the sticks that table. It, yeah. The river sticks. Table. All of the, the gas um, trapped in the epoxy expands. And so the epoxy becomes, um, it becomes bubbly inside. The, the cool thing about it is if you pour it clear and you let that, that bubbly um, harden, it actually has a, almost a, like a crystalline structure look to it. And mm. it's actually kind of cool. Uh, you just have to be careful of what it's touching. I want to see a flaming river table now. It's just, <laughs> it's yeah. just completely unsuccessful. Yeah, we're putting that challenge out to all of our listeners. Uh, first one to make a flaming river table gets a shirt or something. Uh, I'll give them, <laughs> like, I don't know, like uh, 
anything from my store other than like we are you know, not responsible for shops that burn down. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, other yeah. than that, I did um, a picture frame. Uh, well, I, I was going to do a live uh, video doing a picture frame, and uh, about halfway in, I realized, wait a second, I forgot to sharpen my tools beforehand. Oh no! What's so it I'm like to, into this to be like the rest like, of us, James? <laughs> oh. How's and all of these these tools just aren't working, and I'm doing it live, and I'm getting frustrated, and I was just, yeah. Um, so <laughs> I cut it short, and I just turned, turned it into a Q&A, but I'll be doing the rest of it uh, next week. So if you want to see me make a fool of myself, go look at uh, my most recent live video. And yeah, so that's, that's about it for me. I got to <laughs> give you a, a thanks, James, because those uh, I ordered those DMT stones. Uh-huh. Uh, and they're amazing. Like I've used them on my hand planes a few times, but this, this little wrench knife thing that I made yesterday, which I'm, I'm like new to blade making. I'm not good. Um, and, uh, like sharpening knives is definitely an art and I don't have it yet. And I'm pretty sure that a super curved thin blade is probably the hardest thing to sharpen, which just so happens to be exactly what I made yesterday. Um, so I ended up sharpening this thing on the stones and it was so easy. It was crazy. Like those I'm used to, I'm used so to fast. I'm used to those Norton whetstones and it's, mm. and they've always been like super messy. And yeah. I, I feel like the stones are just coming apart, which they are. But uh, yeah, those DMTs are, I mean, this thing is seriously, I spent like, I don't know, probably five, five minutes on the stones, the three stones. And it's like, I mean, if I just let it fall, it'll slice right through paper. It's crazy. So, yeah, <laughs> that's sweet. That's yeah, the, the, those uh, those diamond stones. They number one, they're they're always flat. You don't have to flatten them like wet stones. Number two, they're not a mess. You can just wipe it off when you're done. Number three, they cut incredibly fast. Um, it and uh, you know a lot of people wonder about how long do they last. You know, I've had mine for almost three years now, and uh, and you sharpen your tools every. Yeah, and they I haven't noticed any difference in their in their in their quality. Um, I've seen a few people with the extra uh, the extra extra coarse one uh, that that eventually wears off. Uh, but I, my coarsest one, I think, is what they call just coarse, and I haven't had any issue with it. So yeah, they're, hmm. they're awesome, awesome products. That was a do it. It was a total game changer. And yeah. like, what, what are you using now? Uh, right now, I've got Whetstones and my DMT Duo Sharp. Uh, 600, 1200, I think, but then I sharpen on a 6,000 whetstone. I, I, yeah, I had like every Norton whetstone that, that you could get. And I use those cause I used to sharpen, like I, I have a whole bunch of straight razors that I used to use and I used to sharpen them on those. And then for plain blades, I started using them and, uh, I don't know. It's just so like, you have to like soak them and then like you get, you know, they're just messy. You get crap everywhere. There's water all over the place and they don't cut very fast. So, um, I bought those. It's just so nice to be able to grab those stones and instantly sharpen stuff. So that was, yeah, that was a huge, it makes me not put off sharpening things. I used yeah. to like not sharpen things it. because it was a pain in the butt. Stone. Yeah. So, so what, uh, I agree that it, they are kind of a pain, but, um, just for anybody out there who actually does use wet stones, like I do just because that's what you have, um, go invest in the dollar store, uh, go to the dollar store and find like the perfect size container to, to keep your wet yeah. stone in. Yeah. I just keep mine in water uh, and I change out the water like once a week. Yeah. Uh, but it yeah. makes it really quick. So you don't have to sit there and soak it and you can just go, oh, like I'm dull and you take it out and you see if it's flat and then you sharpen. But yeah. uh, I'm gonna have to look into those, those DMT stones. They're awesome. Um, I used, uh, I just got the, I have the coarse, the fine and the extra fine because mm -hmm. I can set my primary bevels on like my grinder and then just finish them off on the stones really quick. And, and stropping makes a huge difference. Yeah. Definitely. If you're not getting, you know, if you're not getting the edge that you want, uh, you know, a good strop will make a huge difference. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the things that, that people don't like about the DMT stones is if you're used to, uh, if you're used to a wet stone, with a whetstone, the higher the grit you go, the more of a polish you get on the stone. Uh, whereas with diamonds, you actually it starts to get more of a matte finish as opposed to getting a polished finish um, because it's still making 
minute scratches that you can you can almost see, but it's making so many of them so close that it gives it a matte finish. Um, but the moment you take it to a strop, you get that instant polish. And uh, so a lot of people get frustrated because they can't get that really nice shiny surface off of that like they can with like a 16,000 Shapton. Um, so if you're used <clears> to that, <throat> diamonds cut differently, but they cut faster. Something else that's kind of interesting that I'll have to mess around with because I got like that jet uh, buffer like a week or two ago. And I don't know if you guys saw the hammer that I made on my Instagram and mm-hmm. this thing, um, I have, I used to use different polishing compounds in the past and everything that I've done lately, I've just used that mother's aluminum polish and I don't, I, I'm pretty sure it's the best thing ever invented for polishing stuff. I mean, I've used it on steel and I don't know. It just, I mean, I feel like there's something I don't know about like the 400 different like polishing compounds, like the, the three clamshells and like, it, you have, you have no idea like what the, <laughs> yes. like what the, uh, like do you use Tripoli or red or brown red or green? Um, but I just use the, the aluminum polish on everything and it comes out like mirror finish. So yeah, know, cool. might be worth messing around with. Nice. Zach, did you get a chance to try out that Rustlick 5050 in a new jet uh, horizontal bandsaw? Yep. It's wet and blue. Do you, do you like it? <laughs> I, I, I don't have any uh, basis for comparison. <laughs> I mean, it, it, uh, it comes out the nozzle and keeps the blade wet. So <laughs> I think it works. Another uh, sterling review from Zach Herberholtz. So. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, going back to the stropping, we actually have a, a question from the chat. Uh, Jonathan24, one of our uh, avid, a- avid listeners, and uh, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, do you prefer a buffing wheel or leather with buffing compound uh, for sharpening chisels, planes, and why? Do any round over the cutting edge? Uh, I just use a piece of leather scrap for a strop on my bench. Um, but I do have my wet grinder that has a stropping wheel, a leather stropping wheel on it, um, which I actually use for my turning gouges, but not for my bench chisels. Uh, I guess that's my answer. <laughs> I I've never really looked at, buffing like a buffing wheel for um sharp for any like sort of edge work i've always just used thought of it as a way to you know polish things up but i I think i always finish on by stropping on leather because you have more control over like the angle and probably less chance of rounding the the edge over Mm -hmm. that's at least that's my initial yeah my my personal preference is like a really hard horse butt leather um but you know, if I had if I had a, a a full hybrid shop, I probably would have a buffing station, and I would have a a, um, a a loose buffing wheel, and then a very hard buffing wheel, um, or I've seen uh, leather buffing wheels that you can get um, that are uh, much harder, and those are really fast. And uh, I, actually, in the past, uh, before I had hand tools, uh, when I was knife sharpening. Um, I would use one of those and skip the last stone and just basically sharpen on the buffing wheel. Hmm. And uh, it, very, very, very fast, very efficient, works well. Um, you just hmm. have to sell your soul for it. So, <laughs> uh, Where are we? I'm lost. Yes. Questions. Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, we had one uh, submitted this last week on the YouTube channel from uh, Carbonite oh man i always have a problem with his G- last name gamorian gamorian and that's a star star wars reference i believe i star wars the, the gamorians were a porcine race on an outlying planet yeah uh, i'm not sure you're I more of the really worst geek than me i was thinking it was <laughs> a uh, guardians of the galaxy but uh, yeah, Somebody you can tell us what is it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he has uh, a, a question that's more or less a discussion for us, uh, particularly talking about uh, blade or iron radiuses, radii, radius, radius. 
<laughs> Ra radii, I think, um, is the plural. When do you put a, a radius on there, uh, particularly with uh, block, scrub plane, throw, jack, smoother, joiner, etc. Others I forgot. Um, and then uh, um, what about chisels or non-carving uh, chisels like uh, bench, butt, mortise, DT, pairing, timber, slick, etc., etc. Wow, he went to a full detailed list there. He really did, yeah. What do you guys um, think? So a scrub plane, I definitely put a radius on. And I usually do, I think that last scrub I made, uh, I put an 8-inch radius on it um, because I think Chris Schwarz recommended it. I, I don't know. I just said, okay. Um, then uh, as far as your jack and your smoothing planes, I know that a lot of people will put a slight... Um, They'll, they'll round over just the edges of the iron, uh, just so it doesn't leave tracks as you plane. Um, but yeah, I don't know. James, you're kind of the, the resident expert in planes. It all depends on who you talk to. Um, with, with chisels, um, there there is no radius. Um, pretty much across the board, you keep those flat. I, I don't know of anyone who, who puts any radius on their that chisels. That would be kind of weird. Mm -hmm. um, you know, unless it's a curving curve chisel, it's designed yeah. for that. Yeah, um, or maybe even a timber slick because you're because you're kind of using that to push across the wood. But I mean, still. Yeah, usually you just you know give it a little bit of a, a like a forty five degree slide to slice instead of just pushing. But yeah, I I, I I still haven't seen anyone who's done that with it. But it'd be interesting to try. Um, as to planes, that really depends on who you talk to. Um, there are people out there who put a radius on every iron they use. Uh, so even for, you know, your, your jack, your smoother, and your joiner, they still put an ever so slight radius on there so that when the blade is sticking out, the, the reason for it is so that the edges, the very outside corners of the blade, don't actually cut into the wood um, so that you don't get, um, so you don't get tracks in the wood. Um, and so some people will actually put an entire radius all the way across the blade so that happens. Um, that, that's how I used to, I don't think I've had to redo a blade for a long time because don't, they don't get used as much as they used to, but I have a radius on everything but my smoothing plane. And that's it's directly like the more material I'm trying to hog off, the more radius. So mm -hmm. like, you know, a, a scrub plane has the most. And then um, with the exception of my number six, just because for some reason I love that thing and I use it as kind of a, like a, a, a cabinet planer type thing. It's so that one's relatively flat for how big it is. But. Yeah, and if you if you look at you know historical pieces, you'll still see some pieces that actually have these ever so slight um, cambers in the surface from the, the smoothing planes that had an ever so slight uh, round, and you, you can feel that when sliding your hand across it. Um, but then there are other historical pieces that are perfectly flat and smooth um, that you know people didn't put the camber on there. Um, and so then the other thing is that. Uh, anything other than the scrub plane has no camber on it at all. Um, and there's the kind of in between that um, will have no camber on anything except for the smoothing plane. The smoothing plane, they just round off the corners. Um, so when sharpening, you just take five or six passes on each corner to make those um, to make those dip up into the, the plane body so they don't leave a track. Um, I personally have everything perfectly flat except for the um, except for the, the scrub plane. And generally, the, the rule of thumb with a scrub plane is if the iron is fully extended so that the corners of the iron are still inside the mouth, the center of the scrub plane should stick out an eighth inch. Um, and that way, if Jeez. you have it fully extended, you can take an eighth inch pass. Um, I rarely take that much, um, but you know, a softer wood, you can, you can do that across the grain. Uh, most That's of the time, crazy. I only have it sticking out about a sixteenth of an inch. One so of the things... I like having just a little bit of a radius on my like joiner planes, just because I think that, um, cause I still, when I do a table, I still plane all of my joints, but I think having a teeny bit of a radius actually makes it easier to get, um, the edge flat. I know that sounds weird, but like if you get, if you get one side, that's at a little bit of an angle, it's easier to take that off and index it. Cause you can see where the thing's cutting and it sounds counterintuitive, but it, it makes yeah. sense to me. No, that's actually one of the, the the common arguments for having a routed plane, and it, it's a personal preference. 
Um, so you never know until you try it. Uh, and yes, it, it does actually, it, I know that sounds crazy that, you know, you have a rounded surface with a, with a flat, a rounded blade makes a flat surface, but it, it does. <laughs> I mean, it's the, the, the amount of, you know, on the joiner planes, the amount yeah, of it's not like is a so small. Plane. It's, it's, it's like a, like a, a, a three foot radius. Yeah. It's very, very subtle enough to not be consequential in a glue up, but it still helps you. It's easier to find the edge of the board with a round plane than with a, or with a round, um, blade than with the flat one. Cause the flat one just wants to lay flat. The round one wants to center itself. Yeah, and then see, I I just use the the lateral adjustment to tip the blade one way or the other to cut more on one side or the other. Um, but it, it's different mindsets, so you never know until you try. Give it a, give it a try and see what you like. I keep mine flat, <laughs> just because it's easy. Uh, but I, I don't even. I used to do the you know like Rob Cosman talks about whenever he does a sharpening demonstration is you know after you have you know after you've lapped your stones so many times and you just kind of pick up one edge and make you know, a few strokes and then you pick up the other edge and make a yeah. few strokes. Yeah. Um, but I honestly, I don't even do that anymore. Um, unless I'm getting tracks, which if I'm getting tracks. Then I, then then I do deep. do that, but yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that, um, along that line, uh, woodwork life asks the question, how sharp is sharp enough? What do you do to test paper, shave, visible edge? Curly maple, curly hard maple. <laughs> I try to take a super thin pass uh, with in curly hard maple, and if it doesn't tear out, it's sharp enough for me. I, I do the paper test. If I can not slice through paper, if I can just push it through paper, then it's, then I figure it's good enough. Uh, um, for my general use, I actually don't test if it's sharp. Um, I just I, I feel the edge with my finger. And I know what sharp feels like, and I know that sounds really dangerous. But once you've done it a few times, you you can do it without being dangerous. Well, you you sharpen your stuff so much, you don't need to test it. <laughs> oh, and, that, and that's the other thing is that once you get used to it, um, the very first time it touches wood, you know if it's sharp within like a quarter inch of moving. Um, it's it's something that you you've gotten into feeling, and so that's how I test if it's sharp. I, I pick it up and I set it in the in the wood, and if it feels the way I expect it to feel, then I know it's sharp. Um, every now and then I'll, I'll hit it in a, a quarter inch and be like, Oh wait, there's still something in there. Um, but for video sake, uh, like when I'm teaching someone how to sharpen, I can't teach them over the video of how it feels. I, I can give them cues about how it should sound. I can give them cues about what I'm feeling, but I can't really do that. And for someone new to sharpening, that's a very hard thing to communicate. Yeah. And so the, the test I do is shaving arm hairs and the reason I like that is because it gives you a gradient. It's not like, does it cut or doesn't it cut? Um, if you have a moderately dull blade, it will cut hair, but it will miss about half of them. If you have a relatively sharp blade, it will cut hair, but it has a slight scratching feeling and it still misses a couple hairs. If you have a truly sharp blade, it will cut every single hair it touches without any movement, without any feeling on the skin, and it will slice every single hair off perfectly clean in a single smooth, in a single swipe. And uh, that, that that is the, the easiest gradient I can give to people to 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 actually communicate what it, what sharp does, as opposed to what does it feel like. Yeah. Hmm. But no, I don't sharpen my I don't test my arm hairs every time I sharpen. I put it in the blade and I, I use it, and that lets me know if it's sharp. So that brings me, Zach's cutting test brings me to an interesting point. Um, so paper, well, cardboard, but all paper, um, dulls cutting edges faster than like anything I can imagine. So I think it's interesting that so many people use paper as a, as a sharp test because you're actually dulling the blade as you're testing for sharp. I think, I mean, it's not like I sit there and like just completely like shred an entire eight and a half by 11 inch piece of paper. It's like, I'll push it in like maybe a, you know, if, if I can see that it goes in a quarter inch, that's good enough. I can't imagine that that's going to cause any sort of, you yeah. know, actually paper is on hardness about the same as maple. Really? Mm -hmm. All yeah. right. The, the reason we will. see it is dulling yeah. very quickly. <laughs> um, the reason we see it is dulling very quickly is that most of the time the tools that we're cutting with are very, very fine blade items like a razor blade or a very sharp knife. And they have a, an angle bevel that's like 10 degrees. Well, that angle bevel will dull instantly if you put it into wood. 
Um, and so if you're if you're cutting paper with it, you'll 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 notice that it dulls very quickly, like a razor blade that you expect to be an extremely sharp thing to last for a while will dull after five or six boxes. Yeah. Well, that's like uh, this is because it have a very fine bevel that will dull quickly. Well, that's like if you ever go into uh, a house where someone sews like a seamstress and you grab her seamstress scissors and try to cut a piece of paper, she'll yeah. probably murder you. Yeah. <laughs> I've noticed that because I have a really, really nice pair of, uh, God, I forget the brand of it. They have the gold handle. They're like one of the nicest pair of um, like sewing scissors i don't know my terminology shears i don't know but yeah i had to cut some like paper templates out of it and i noticed after like 10 12 cuts like i had to add lube to the edge just because i don't know i don't know what happened there but like it really really screwed it up i had to i had to like put some oil on it and then it was fine and i'm like okay i should probably use worse like cheap <laughs> cool well let's uh let's move on because this week we are doing the creator's photo challenge and uh oh no we didn't pick a ne next week as well so we'll have to think about that um but we're actually going to be picking this week's winners and uh this week oh, yeah. uh, zach is going to be sending you something yes um, so uh zach since you're at the bottom of the list why don't you fill yours in but uh, will and i will go first sounds good <laughs> yeah what you got will uh, so my two are uh, the Whiskered Woodsmith, um, who posted a photo of a combination square uh, on his jointer, setting up the fence to forty-five degrees, and the line of the uh, the line that's created by the jointer bed and the fence uh, led you directly into the combination square. And I thought it it uh, really exemplified the leading lines theme. Um, the line of the jointer led your eye to the combination plane. So technically, it was like exactly what the theme was. So uh, kudos to you. You are my you are my first my first guy or girl. I'm not sure. I'm assuming since you're the whiskered woodsmith that you are of the male. Well, person. We can only hope. <laughs> not that there's anything wrong with that. Hey, you know, you do you. Um, and then, uh, <laughs> my second is Birch Tree Farms, which, uh, they, I guess they're, a, they have a sawmill and they were cutting, they were milling up, um, some birch trees. So bonus points for being Birch Tree Farms while also milling birch trees. Uh, and they had the, the, the line was the kerf of the, the sawmill cutting the birch tree. And, uh, I just thought it was just a, a really cool photo the the curly bark of birch is always really really cool um the like the, the paper bark i don't know if you yeah. i guess I don't, know, I don't know if all bir birch are paper bark or not but uh, no. this one had, had birch that paper bark. are made out of that stuff yeah um so yeah those are my two uh james what do you have well my number one is also the uh the birch tree farms um i just really liked that uh um I don't know, live edge a shallow depth of field good coloring just that that nice warm it was a very happy picture uh, made me made me happy <laughs> uh, but uh, my my second one i would have to say is uh handcrafted by anus uh, anus ons 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 derek ons he lives <laughs> sorry there's, there's Jim doing his job see i said we're going to do it intentionally so, so he, he totally meant that but uh, he has this, uh, uh, I don't know if it's a series of boards. Uh, I think it's like a, a picture box um, and they're getting ready for corner miter glue ups. I, I haven't looked at it farther than that, but uh, uh, has grooves running along it and uh, the shallow depth of field and perfectly crisp, clear tape. Uh, I just really liked that. It was just a, a very beautiful picture, very warming and I, I like it. So that's my, my second picks. For some reason, I can't load instagram to post the links on my computer it says i couldn't i couldn't either i don't know what was up with that um so i'm gonna go with um mcallister home and mm -hmm. it's just it's just hand playing on a table and the table is like pointing so like you said there, there's some good stuff that's like has the leading lines but they're not like leading yep. they're not like serving the the purpose of drawing your eyes to an object they're really cool shots um but for sake of um, hitting the point and drawing your attention to an object. Uh, McAllister home hand playing on a table. The table's 
It's just a good perspective. And we go with uh, Justin Limoges. 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 I met, actually met nice. him at uh, somewhere this year. I don't even remember where we were at. I think it was the Atlanta, the Workbench Con thing. He's a cool guy. So, yeah, that's it's a neat picture that's just, again, just kind of uh, drawing your eyes to um, a chop saw in the background. It'd be interesting to see what the difference of having the foreground in focus versus having the object that it's drawing your attention to in focus. It'd be interesting to see it the other way. But, yeah, so those are my two. Sweet. Yeah. Um, so one person has two votes? Yep, that would be... Uh, birch Tree Farms? Bir birch Tree Farms, yeah. So we all win some birch. Is that how it works? Yeah, exactly. We get the prize. So now, now you have to send us some, some wood. birch birch. <laughs> birch birch. That's it. You you win because you get to send us. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. Yeah. So, so Zach, you'll take care of the, the prize this week. Or this, yes. This and yeah, I'm still waiting for my my next batch of shirts that should be here any day now. So I they sold out. I literally ordered a batch of shirts and ordered another one like four or five days after I got them. I couldn't believe. I thought everybody wanted black and I had black shirts initially and I sold a lot of those, but it's just so hot. I mean, it's amazing the difference in shirt colors and temperature. Anyway, what am I talking about? Cool. Well, um, we did have a joke of the week uh, sent to me, and I can't for the life of me find out oh. who sent it to me. It was in one of the live chat in my, my videos. and he, I got one, too, um, and it's somewhere on my Instagram, and I can't. And since I was doing a video on making a picture frame with uh, with, with Hickory, I said, oh, stink, I just gave it away, didn't I? Uh, uh, I don't know. I don't know. There's no answer in the What, in the, what does my yeah. picture frame and Andrew Jackson have in common? They're both old Hickory. <laughs> Wait, I'm laughing. At, I'm laughing at the lack of. Uh, <laughs> I don't. I don't get it. <laughs> Andrew was, Jackson's nickname was Old Hickory. Uh, yeah. 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 See, I yeah, seventh that. president. You, you never did I, that history I, thing. I know who Andrew Jackson is. I <laughs> never got his nickname. <laughs> I feel really bad because somebody sent me a joke through Instagram, and it is totally buried somewhere, and I don't even know where to find it it was like a cartoon with a punchline in it and i totally forgot so whoever's listening to this you can send it to me again and i won't forget this time <laughs> the creators collective podcast where you send us stuff and we might talk about it maybe yeah <laughs> uh, um, oh we didn't talk about what uh, the next photo challenge would be um, do you have any idea as well yeah so i've been trying to epoxy I'm on bouncing. the floor yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I've been uh, bouncing some stuff around in my head. Um, this this time, I think I want to go with minimalist. So something, clean. In your yeah, very clean. Something in your shop, but try to separate it from from everything. So, like not taking a picture of something in front of my tool wall. Yeah, exactly. Clean, clean, super, super clean is is the theme. What's wait? I'm sorry, I was responding to a comment. What's the challenge? Minimal, minimalist. So very clean images. Um, think uh, like a single, like a single plank of wood on a white background or yeah. something like that. Mm. Yeah. Type in modern furniture into YouTube and use any of those thumbnail thumbnails. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yes. Yeah, so uh, try to think simple, try to think, uh, pay a lot of attention to what the object is or what the subject is and try to remove all other distractions from the image. Sweet. So you have two weeks to get that in and uh, we'll be looking at those pictures for uh, two weeks from now. This is actually turning into a lot of fun, so I'm, I'm liking this. And, and thank you for everyone who posts those. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah. Put them on Instagram with the hashtag hashtag creators photo challenge. We'll be hmm. we'll be. It's gonna be really out. hard for me to do anything clean in my shop. Yes, I know I'm the same way. Like, cool. uh, yeah. Uh, well, let's uh, talk about what's been inspiring us. What are we watching and reading? Uh, Will, oh, what yeah. you got? 
so I know I've shouted out this channel before, um, but Lignum, uh, the guys that have those crazy five axis Kuko, Kuku, uh, CNC, Kuka, Kuka CNC machines, uh, put out a their Pixel Lounger, which was really pretty incredible even though they used a cnc i could see this project being done without a cnc um and so what they did was they took a lot of square stock it looked maybe like it was two by two or an inch and a half by inch and a half i think it was probably pine um and they glued up they made a template of the shape of the the lounger that they wanted to make and then they glued up i don't know a couple hundred pieces a couple hundred lengths of this one by uh, one by one by material. Um, and then they carved out a, a bench seat, like a lounge seat in the, in the chair side, and then just left the random lengths on the backside. Uh, it was just a really interesting experiment in design. Um, and re just really impressive. And it looked like a hell of a glue up that I would never want to do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking forward to watching that one. now. I didn't see that before. Yeah, it's really, really cool. Sweet. Um, Zach, what are you watching? Um, where'd my phone go? Oh, I wrote it in the thing. Um, so I'm just reading the same books that nobody wants to hear about. So uh, I am going to... Didn't I post the thing in here somewhere? Uh, yeah. So this guy, he's like some guy out of Korea. And, uh, yeah, I know, right? JJR... 2001 Whoa. 2001 that's his instagram some guy in korea that just makes the most unbelievable like metal sculptures i've ever seen they're unbelievable and he only has like four thousand followers and uh wow. yeah just it'll wow. blow your it'll blow your mind so just check him out and follow him and that thing is huge yeah it's it his his work is unbelievable so wow that's, that's my my secret Okay, yeah, if you guys are listening to this, you've got to go look him up. I just put the, the link in the live chat as well as in, uh, that'll be in the description, but this is just... Yeah, every I time... I was going, wow, and that's just like, it's, it's nothing. This is Every time, I've been following him for a while, and every time his stuff comes up in my Instagram feed, I'm like, I suck. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't, I will never be able to do this. That is cool. So... Yeah. I click it's follow. it's like one of those things that's just so good that you can't even really comprehend it. You're just like, yep, that's amazing. And you scroll by it because you're like, I can't even wrap my mind around what's yeah, going the on. The live chat right now is going absolutely crazy watching that. <laughs> 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 it's just like every, holy crap. Oh my God, damn. <laughs> that's a sculpture. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that guy is incredible. Follow him. That's I just I just followed him. So yeah, there we go. You're welcome, JJR cool. 2001 2001. Well, I'm going to mention someone who is actually currently in our live chat, um, Make Brooklyn. Um, he did a, a leather clutch bag um, about a week or two ago. And uh, um, really sweet. I just, I don't know why. Leather working to me is one of those things I can just watch, um, especially when you get into the stitching and the burnishing. And the, the, that's just, ah, oh, it's. So, so cool. So I'm actually, I'm, I'm working with him, hopefully doing a collab here soon. And uh, that'll be a lot of fun. But definitely go check out. If you haven't seen Make Brooklyn, he's a bunch of cool things over there. And uh, that bag was just the most recent cool thing he's done on there. Cool. Right on. I'm sorry, but it's not a 20 foot tall sculpture, but still. It's really cool. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we should have got the Zach last. Sorry, Make Brooklyn. Yeah. <laughs> wow. All right, cool. All the time. <laughs> Well, what we got for uh, product of the week, uh, Zach? You got something? Um, oh yeah, uh, I don't know. It's it's I don't know that I don't need to get you guys the model number or anything. It's um, so I, I in my all the stuff that showed up in my shop lately, um, I got the uh, industrial grinding sanding station thing. It's the it's a jet one. It has a six by 46 or six by 48 i don't remember the belt on it and then it's got the 12 inch disc sander on the side mm -hmm. and um it's unbelievable like i got it thinking like oh this will be great for like when i have to square up my you know miters or 
for metal or wood or whatever. And I've seriously used it every day, like for so many things that I never would have thought that I would use it for like that, that cone thing that I turned on the lathe. I actually, since I was doing the segments, I was able to, before I even glued it up, I was able to do, cause it was, I think it was like a 30 degree, um, taper. So I, I set the, um, disc sander to like 25 degrees and ground everything down. So when I put it on the lathe, I had like almost no turning to do on the segmented thing. It was pretty much just to smooth it out, but it's just great for flattening. All, it, it's amazing. So if you don't have a, a, a disc sander, it's such a handy tool to have. That's one of my favorite tools in the shop. That's like one of those, you know, you'd never knew you needed it until yes. you one and then you yes. use it every day. Uh, yeah. I was just mine yesterday. Um, the combo sander it's just freaking awesome yeah yeah and i mean the belt's great too it 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 just takes material off i mean it's it'll take a quarter inch off faster than you can cut it um but the disc sander is just so great for like flattening things and going around corners i don't know why it works better than the belt sander but it definitely works better for you know doing outside corners and stuff yeah, uh, yeah. it's just uh and like you said, I had no idea I needed one until I got it. And now everything is so much easier. Yeah. Do you, you have one of those? Do spindle sanding. I have one yeah. of those too. Yeah. You should make do an you... attachment where you can put that on where the drum is at. Yeah. What were you going to yeah. say, Will? Do you have uh, one of the rubber sticks for unloading the, the paper? Because mm-hmm. that's a really good investment. Yeah. Like a couple bucks. Yep. I have one. Cool. Good. <laughs> yeah. All right. my tool. Well, what you got, Will? Uh, got to say my branding iron from Cranford Design Works. Um, they don't have a website, but they have a Facebook page uh, where you can go and click on the About link, and you can get a quote request from them. Uh, I think it took four to six weeks for it to come, uh, but it's a brass head. Uh, it's got the handle is actually turned from Amy Griggs, uh, turned by Amy Griggs, who's uh, a pretty awesome – Instagram wood turner. Uh, she's becoming quite prop popular, uh, which I, I don't know if you guys have noticed this, but um, women and turning is becoming pretty huge, uh, which I think is super cool. Um, but my branding iron is I'm just going to go brand everything. It's just a lot of fun. They are a huh. lot of fun. Yeah. So, James, what do you got? Um, I'm going to have to go with a, a thumb saver. Um, it's a, a basically a refrigerator matic, magnet you can put on the back of a card scraper, and uh, I I saw that. That's awesome that you're selling those. There, there. I, I don't know why. Um, the the only downside to using a card scraper is you only get like ten or so strokes until the thing heats up and your thumbs start to burn and you start to melt the uh, the, the 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 thumbprint off of your thumb. Um, but uh, if you put a magnet on the back, it uh, stops that. Which is kind of just like, duh. <laughs> so I had uh, someone in in my uh, um, uh, Wood by Right Hive Mind group on Facebook mentioned, "Hey, you should uh, sell those on your site." And I thought that'd be awesome. So I made a refrigerator magnet with the picture of a card scraper on it, and uh, so now I'm selling those on my website. And they're so they're almost the price of a, a sticker, basically. And you can get your own card scraper magnet to go on your card scraper. That's cool. Yeah, you have, you've had some cool merch ideas lately, man. The uh, the puzzle was super cool, and yeah. this this just some yeah, cool I finally got fun the items. Back in stock that that blew yeah. my mind. Those those sold out within the matter of like uh, two or three hours. That's crazy. Oh, wow. And wow. Uh, so I I finally got those back in stock. So if you weren't able to get a puzzle before, they're they're now on the site. Wow. Hey guys, so real quick, I just want to because we have the audience here. I know we're running over on time, but. Um, and I just wanted to discuss it with you guys and might as well do it on air, but talking about merch in your, on your website, um, I want to start doing an auction for some of the things that are coming out of my shops Some like one-off things like, like the coasters I'm doing for the, for this, uh, finish tests and bowls, boxes, things like that. What do you guys think the best way to get it out there for auction? Uh, do you just announce it on your channel and then make like an eBay seller site? Uh, or just put it out there on Facebook or what do you guys have in mind for things like that? I'd say the best way is to give it to Jimmy Duresta and have him put it on eBay. (laughs) (laughs) 
I think uh, outside the box. I like it. <laughs> yeah, I think I would try Facebook and see if there's any problems with it. Um, because I think that it would just be the easiest and simplest thing. Okay. Um, because it's, you know, you're in control then and it's just one off item and you're basically just focusing on your audience as opposed to, because the nice thing about eBay is you're, um, you're using eBay's resources to have people find it. Whereas that really doesn't matter as much as your, your, uh, viewers. Okay. Yeah. Maybe I'll try Facebook first. I know Zach, you've kind of auctioned off things to the highest bidder on, so I've, you know, what worked really well for me was Instagram. Instagram. I couldn't believe it. Like I made something I'm like, uh, make me an offer. And it just like went crazy. And then I did the same thing. I'm like, okay, if you're interested in this, like I'm going to put it up for auction on my Facebook and just between Instagram and Facebook, like whichever, whoever has the highest amount, I'll sell it to obviously. And I sold like five or six things that way and got a, a good price for him so i was thinking about selling this knife but i kind of want to keep it because it's the first one i made but um no i was thinking that what would be really cool is if somebody uh who's not me came up with like a site that was for uh like an auction site for makers that would be really cool but i'm not going to do it so <laughs> <laughs> well it's happened again you guys have totally messed up another hour's worth of your life and uh we are happy for that so thank you for listening <laughs> i do want to say a huge thank you again to our patrons on patreon now that we're getting that up and going again if you have uh, some ideas for uh, giveaways or swag or things like that we can do on patreon please let us know uh, particularly thank you to uh darren mates uh you are our top patron there if you'd like to have your name mentioned on us uh go check that out patreon.com backslash creators collective so that's about it for today. And until next time, have a wonderful day. See you later. Adios, muchachos.